We'll be looking at the whole chapter, uh, verses 1 through 30 of Daniel chapter 3. Now this sermon is a tough one, which is odd because it should be an easy one. We are looking at the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I knew practically everything about this story before studying the Hebrew text or reading a single commentary. Uh, The reason being is that if you grew up in Sunday school or children's church, the story of the fiery furnace is one of the most popular stories. And well, it should be. This story is exciting. They have four men who are risking their lives for God. And then it comes and it has a wonderfully happy ending. They get thrown in the midst of the fire, but then they they aren't burned. God comes to them in the midst of the fire and delivers them. What is there not to love? I mean, looking at this picture on the screen, I could just picture these four guys like a barbershop quartet singing in the midst of the fire. Light the fire in my soul, fan the flame, make it whole. It is a fun story with a fun message, but it's not. Out of all of the sermons that we're going to have in this series, today's most certainly is the most difficult to apply and live out. This message, this topic is where so many people in the church will draw a line in the sand and say, I can't cross that line. And Daniel 3 says, we're going to go right over it. We've been talking about how to prepare our lives for godliness in a fallen culture. How do we live for God in a world that either hates Him or denies that He exists altogether? And Daniel has been walking us down this road, preparing us for the godliness that will surround us, first by pointing us toward holiness and then boldness, and then an eternal focus on the kingdom of God. Now, through the story of the fiery furnace, we are called to prepare ourselves for the one thing that we pray will never come to us, and that many in the church will abandon ship as soon as it arrives, and that is to prepare ourselves for suffering. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is a story about three young men who prepared themselves to suffer and even die for the name of the Lord. They were prepared to suffer in the face of idolatry. And here is where we need to sit back and ask ourselves a very honest question. Am I ready to suffer? Am I prepared to be isolated, mocked, imprisoned, pained, or possibly to die for my faith in Jesus Christ? This is not a children's story. We will begin by preparing our hearts for why the world will attack us, and then we will look at how we are to respond to those attacks. So let's look first at the setup for our story, and as I read through the beginning of Daniel 3, for time's sake, I'm not going to read the name of every political position and every instrument in our passage this morning. Nebuchadnezzar, the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and its width, 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, 
To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire." Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So our story starts with Nebuchadnezzar basically holding an outside church or religious service. He sets up a worship service out in the suburbs of Dura and calling on all people to bow before a statue that is 80 feet tall and nine feet wide. Based upon those measurements, what Nebuchadnezzar most likely set up was an obelisk. So think more the image of the Washington Monument and not the image that was on the screen of an idol or a person that we talked about two weeks ago. And what was the point of worshiping this one idol when the only monotheistic religion in the world at that time period, the only religion that worshiped only one God was Judaism? the religion of Yahweh, the God of the Jews. Why would Nebuchadnezzar bring people from every language and under every ruler with every type of instrument? And I didn't even read the names of all the instruments because we're not sure what all of those words mean. And we think it's because what Nebuchadnezzar did was he picked obscure instruments from all the different parts of the land that he was ruling. So we don't even know what these instruments necessarily stood for. And most likely, Nebuchadnezzar pulled all of these people, all of these instruments together. The point of this ceremony was not to say, hey, everyone, we're now going to have one religion. You can only worship this tower. Instead, the point of this ceremony was for Nebuchadnezzar to take his empire that had stretched farther than any empire the world had ever known and had been placed under a single authority, his point was to say, I want to gather you all together and to make sure that you are all unified under me. So what we really see in Daniel chapter 3 is a giant unity celebration. It is Nebuchadnezzar saying, everyone needs to unite under me. You all need to do this one thing, this one religious act, and then once we all worship together, I'll know that we were all united as a single person. And if you don't unite with us, that means you oppose us. And from Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon to Rome in the days of the early church, to the Catholics in the time of the Reformation, to Stalin in the 20th century, to Kim Jong-un today, when you trace the persecution of the people of God from ancient history to today's postmodern history, one of the most common excuses for the persecution of God's people is man's call for unity. It is not enough for us in the church to be kind and loving and forgiving to one another, but we all must unite in faith, in worldview, in religion, and in morality. So if the church won't bow before Caesar with the Romans, if we will not deny God along with the Soviets, we must be destroyed in the name of unity. During the persecution of the Orthodox Christians in the Soviet states, the goal of the persecutors was to break Christians so that they would deny the benefit of faith in Jesus Christ in order to get them to say that the religion of Christianity was pointless. Therefore, we can unite together as atheists and believing that there were no God. 
Now, what I'm about to say is graphic, and I'll try my best not to be grotesque in this historical account. And in order to try to get the Christians to abandon their faith and in order to get them to turn to atheism, what the jailers would do is that they would force all of the Christians in prison to relieve themselves on plates and in cups. And then they would require priests or pastors to perform the entire mass ritual over those filthy plates and filthy cups from the blessing to the serving to the partaking. And the goal of this heinous form of persecution was to end up forcing Christians to confess that the body and the blood of Christ was as worthless as plates and cups covered in excrement. Because if the world cannot unite us to support their views and their thinkings, they will attempt to break us or silence us. This is the end goal of persecution, unity through the denial of God. And it is not only unity that will drive the world to bring suffering into our lives, but also it will be envy. Look now at verses 8 through 12. For this reason, at that certain time, Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. So we read at the beginning of the chapter that actually the people who are all called together and to bow down before this giant golden obelisk, it was not actually all of the people throughout Babylon. That would have been far too many. But what Nebuchadnezzar was calling on was the administration, the officials who were ruling over all of the different regions, they were to bow down before this statue. So it was the the overseers. So when we read here in verse 8 that certain Chaldeans came and reported Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what we need to understand is that these would have been the the co-workers, the fellow overseers with these three Jews who tattled on them and told Nebuchadnezzar that they were not worshiping the statue before them. And based on the end of Daniel chapter 2, I think it's really easy to guess why their fellow Chaldeans and co-workers would have been quick to throw these three young Jews into the fire. Remember how Daniel chapter 2 ended. Daniel 2.49 said, And Daniel made request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon, while Daniel was at the king's court. So while Daniel was serving in the palace, he had assigned his three best friends probably the most envious position of all of the administration of the Babylonian Empire. And that is these three Jews were overseeing the province of Babylon itself. They were ruling over the capital of the largest empire in the world. And you can just think how it would have embittered and enraged the Chaldeans to see their Jewish slaves lifted to a place of prominence. Not just any place of prominence, but over their own home territory of all places. I think probably the best modern-day equivalent would have been if for some reason Hitler had decided to uplift three Jews to manage and oversee Germany during World War II. How much would those Jews have been hated and despised 
and schemed against by other Germans who were living in Germany and ruling in Germany at that time. Because if we're honest about human nature and human traits, nothing embitters us and stirs us up toward anger and hatred like envy. They have the position I want. I didn't say that quite right. Envy would say they have the position I deserve. And when we become obsessed with what we deserve, with what we desire, someone else possesses what should be mine, our envy will drive us to throw people into the fire so we can have what they have. Envy is also what leads us to say, I want what you have. And if I can't have what you have, I will destroy you so none of us can have it. And the Chaldeans were ready to burn Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to death in order to get at their position in Babylon. I think we can look at the list of sins in the Bible and say every sin in the Bible is destructive. But very few sins have the potential of destruction, both destroying ourselves when we allow it to burn in our own hearts and also the lives of others like envy. How many families have been burned to the ground over envy for the spouse of another? How many careers have been ruined over envy because I can't be content in the position that I have, but I must do whatever I can to scheme and work behind the scenes to take the position of another? How many churches have been torn in two by only two individuals because one is envious of the sway that another person has over the congregation? Envy kills And the devil uses envy in this world to kill churches. Reading throughout church history, it is tragic how often persecution begins against the church, not over our faith, not over our doctrine, but as an excuse to take our property, our businesses, and our possessions. I learned this just a couple of weeks ago as I'm reading a book entitled uh, Early Christianity in North Africa. But actually, the tradition that we have today to have chapels and churches on cemetery grounds, uh, that tradition did not begin with us in America, but that's actually an ancient African tradition. And how did that tradition begin in Africa where they would build their churches and their chapels on cemetery grounds? Well, it began because in the first two centuries of the church in northern Africa, uh, that period of Africa was actually controlled by Rome. And Rome set up a policy that if a person confessed faith in Jesus Christ, their faith as a Christian was used as a pretext for Roman authorities to confiscate their property and their possession. And in an attempt to ostracize the church and to separate Christians from society and squash the growing Christian movement, they refused also to allow Christians to be buried in the common community cemeteries. What their goal was to say is, we want Christians to be as rejected from society in death as we rejected them from society in life. So how did the church then respond? The church responded in northern Africa by coming together and creating their own little cemetery plots. They would have their own cemetery and land that nobody wanted. And then once Christians started burying Christians in these plots of land, no one wanted to touch that land for anything. Because you don't want to use the land where, I heard they buried some Christians over there. And since nobody wanted the land of the Christian cemeteries, they thought, hey, you know, the one place we could build our church and nobody would take it would be on the cemetery grounds. And that's how they began to build chapels and churches around cemeteries in order to protect them from being confiscated. So we need to be prepared for our culture, for our society 
to use envy in order to attack and persecute the church. And I think one of the ways where we see that coming in America today, and we've seen it come in past societies, is when envy is transformed in a culture from a sin to a virtue. And I think, sadly, this is happening very often in America today. It was envy in the land of the Chaldeans that turned on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and handed them over to their death. And the same may occur in our own society today when it is seen as a good and and a worthy pursuit in order to desire what someone else has. And if I can't have it based on my own hard work, I'm going to destroy what they have so no one can have it. And so we see in the beginning of Daniel 3, unity and envy are what drives the persecution of these three young Jews. Unity and envy, very odd bedfellows. I wouldn't necessarily put those together as the driving force of persecution, but it is crazy how when you look back at the history of God's people, both in Israel and in the church, how often the driving force of persecution is either a call to unity, We must all have the same atheistic worldview. We must all worship the same God together. Or the idea of envy is so often why God's people are persecuted. And we need to be ready for the world's call to unity and for the world's call and push and acceptance of envy to be what brings suffering upon our church today. That's when we see those rising is when we need to brace ourselves to say, I need to be ready to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ because the persecution is right around the corner. And how we are to respond to that suffering, we see that through the actions of our heroes in verses 16 through 22. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we are able to serve, who we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, Let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He answered by by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes and were cast in the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the, faint flame, the flame of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We only really have time to key in on one phrase here in this section, and it's in verses 17 and 18. When these three young Jews tell the king that our God may save us, our God may allow us to die, But it doesn't matter which one to us. Regardless of the result of our action, we will obey our God. We will obey regardless of the outcome. If you want to be able to stand in the day of persecution and suffering, you need to be ready for one of two things. You need to be ready on the one hand for your 401k to continue to grow, to have those finances carry you throughout your retirement years. You also need to be ready for the government one day to step in and confiscate the bank accounts and retirement accounts of all those who are in current memberships of Christian churches. We need to be thankful that we live in a land 
where we have the freedom of speech, where it is valued, and we also need to be prepared to live in a land where the freedom of speech is trampled. And we need to be prepared to stand for Christ, even if our stand is made illegal by the laws and we are cut off from society for confessing the name of Jesus Christ. This is the time where you need to determine in your own heart to do two things. First, we need to be thankful for all of the blessings that God gives to us in times of peace. I think based on what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say is that obviously they would have been thrilled that day if Nebuchadnezzar would have looked at them and said, you know what, guys, I think a fiery furnace might have been a little bit too overboard. I might be taking this thing a little bit too far. I'm really not going to throw you in the fiery furnace and burn you to death. I think obviously if that would have happened, they would have glorified God and thanked Him for the deliverance that they were given. It would have resulted in praise and worship to God. So too today, we need to thank and we need to glorify our God every single day for placing us in a nation where we have the freedom to gather together and worship God and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to thank God for placing us in a nation where we don't need to fear law enforcement, showing up on Sunday morning and confiscating our property and taking our church for the use of the government. But while we are thankful today, at the same time we do not, we must not allow our fear over losing today's blessing to possibly drive us to deny our faith, to embrace immorality, or to hide away from society in fear. Your confession of Christ, your holiness before God the Father, your following the Holy Spirit and producing His fruit in this world, all of them are more important than your freedom your finances, and even your life in this world. Cyprian, the bishop of the church of Carthage in the third century, wrote that at the beginning of the third century, there was a newly enacted Roman law that brought persecutions upon the church of Jesus Christ, the likes of which the church had never seen before, and they had seen some terrible persecutions in the early generations. And after that new law was put into place, there were some church leaders in Carthage who gathered up their entire churches together. They would march through the main thoroughfares of Carthage as one, They would come into the amazing forum of Carthage and the churches would walk together carrying flowers, incense, and dragging animals alongside them. And then as a church of Jesus Christ together, they would offer sacrifices to Caesar and the Roman gods. They were not prepared for suffering. And so the result was was that they denied the gospel in order to worship the gods of this world. And one of the tragic turns in history is that the vast majority of those Christians who sacrificed those animals to Roman gods a few short years later came back in tears and fasting and self-condemnation and repentance over their apostasy. And that was the greatest regret of their entire lives. So the question is, are we prepared to, on the one hand, be thankful for what God has given us today? And then on the other hand, are we prepared to forsake those same blessings for the name of Jesus Christ? You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were prepared to suffer. 
because they were both thankful for the blessings that God had given them thus far in Babylon. Because you think about it, in Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2, things were going wonderfully for those Jews. God had blessed them when Daniel and his friends refused to eat the king's food. Then Daniel interpreted the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar, and things were going better and better, and they were so happy for the lives that God were giving them in Babylon until... They all came crashing down. You see, these Jews' faith was built not on their circumstances, but they were built on their faith in the promises of God. So let us be those who are prepared to suffer, both by being thankful for what God has given us today, but also to be ready to lose it if God chooses to take it from us in a time of suffering. And finally, what we're going to see in this passage is that those who are prepared to suffer are those who are ready to reach the world and even their persecutors for Christ. Look now at verses 23 through 30 of Daniel chapter 3. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, Was it not three men we cast into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the midst of the fire. The king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angels and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongues that speak anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn from limb to limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap. Inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way, then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. Now, I got to say, there's a lot I want to say about these verses. There's a lot of good stuff here, but it is already after uh, 11 o'clock. And so we're going to move quickly through this. Um, First, you know, we have the glorious vision of the four men walking in the midst of the fire. One of the men, Nebuchadnezzar says, is a son of the gods. And this was the Chaldean way of saying that there is a divine, angelic-like being in the midst of the fire with these three Jews. Now, I believe this is an appearance of the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. But to be honest, it could really be any angelic being because we aren't given any details uh, of this person who stood with our heroes. Uh, But regardless if it is Christ himself or an angel, uh, what a wonderful picture that God is with us in the midst of our suffering. No child of Christ suffers alone. This is something Jesus testified to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, that when he was Saul persecuting the church, that Saul was not persecuting the church, but he was persecuting Jesus Christ himself. But what stuns me in relation to what I think our goals should be In times of suffering, maybe the most miraculous part of our passage 
is the 180 degree turn of Nebuchadnezzar in this story. He goes from earlier in Daniel chapter 3, jumping up and down in rage, tearing out his beard, calling the furnace to be heated seven times hotter, saying, burn these men to death. And then the next minute he is saying, blessed be their God. And I think in times of suffering, we all need to be aiming to see that shift, that repentance happen to all those we interact with in this world. Our goal is not to defeat. Our goal is not to conquer those who oppose the gospel. But our goal should always be to reach this world that they may worship our God and they may believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior. If we look at everything that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do in this story, they always conduct themselves in such a way that when God does deliver them, Nebuchadnezzar has no choice but to bless their God for what he has done. You see, these three young Jews were not living to be adversaries of the king. In fact, they were living the exact opposite way. They were living to the best of their ability in the king's service and not to oppose him in what he is doing. So therefore, when the time of persecution and suffering came, they were able to turn Nebuchadnezzar to one who would bless the God they were serving. And may we remember in our own dark days in our lives, when people mock our names, when they spew hatred all over the Savior who we hold most dear, when they rip away our freedoms, and when they even attack our closest friends and family and ourselves. Remember that while the world is at war with us, we are not at war with the world. We want to see those who oppose Christ believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. We want to see our persecutors come to bless and follow our Savior. We are only truly ready to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ when we put on the mindset of Jesus on the cross where we will say to our persecutors, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. And Christians, we need to be prepared for that day when suffering may come upon us. Because like I said, if you look at Daniel 1 and Daniel 2, things could not have been going any better for the Jews who are living in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar. He was blessing them in every way. He was moving them into positions of prominence. They should have been sitting on easy street. But one, from Nebuchadnezzar's eyes, one small policy change, one little unity celebration, a few men becoming envious was all it took for their days of blessing to turn into days of suffering. And the same could happen for us in the church today. So are we prepared in our hearts to suffer? Are we prepared to thank God for the blessings that we've been given today and then to continue to thank God for when those same blessings are taken away? So may we be like the heroes of Daniel chapter 3. May we prepare our hearts, may we prepare our minds and our souls to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ.